All right. So the first question is um, how you can set the color of individual data points and um, depending on their value. I guess the easiest way to do that would be to call the function multiple times. So you um, you sort your data into um, the ones you want to assign one color to and the data you want to have another color. And then um, you just call the function, whatever it is, plot or scatter or something like that. You call it twice and then um, pass different color arguments to that to those two calls. I guess that would be the easiest. Okay, anything else? Because if not, um, I have two small comments I want to make about that homework. Um, those were about questions we got in the forum already. And then I'll just quickly talk about that. Okay, wait, I'm not the presenter. I think, I, yeah, I can just take presenter. Ha, I'm presenter now. All right, uh, so I can share my screen. Okay. All right, so just to talk about the current homework quickly. Um, in task one, in the histogram task, uh, this range thing caused some confusion. And um, yeah, the thing with histograms is that if you don't pass this range parameter, then it will just use the minimum and the maximum of your data that you passed in the current call to the hist function. So it will um, create as many bins as you specified in this range. And now if you create, if you call the hist function multiple times with different uh, data ranges, then your histogram will have uh, yeah, differently positioned um, bins. So they will not align, but they will be kind of um, yeah, shifted. And uh, they might also have different sizes because um, yeah, for some distribution, your I don't know, 20 uh, um, bins would be distributed over um, over like a, a range from zero to 10. And for another distributions, you would have 20 bins again, which are then distributed from zero to 100. And of course, those bins have different sizes. And this would look a little bit confusing uh, because your bins should have the same size for different distributions um, for them to be really comparable. And this is what you can achieve with this range parameter. And the way you do this, uh, so this hint already tells you that you have to use the range parameter and that by default, the min of the current data and the maximum are used as the range. But now what um, at least two people have done already was to just specify um, a fixed range. So just, um, yeah hard code the values of this range parameter in the histogram call. And this is actually not what you should do. Of course, this works. This achieves the same thing, but this is not what the sample solution did. And we probably should have, or I prob probably should have specified this um, in, the, in the hint or in the task description a little clearer. But uh, what you should do is just take the minimum of all the distributions and the maximum of all distributions and pass those to the range parameter of every call to the hist function. Um, and this just makes sure that um, you always have the right range for all distributions that you might pass to this function. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure um, the, the values that um, at least one of the two people passed to the function looked like they might have actually been the um, the minimum and the maximum of all the data, but hard coded. And the PyTest will test two different uh, calls to this plot histogram, or the, just the histogram function that you have to implement. And it will use different distributions. So if you hard code the values, then one of those uh, will definitely fail. 
and uh, yeah that means that you actually have to compute the minimum and the maximum of all your distributions in this histogram function okay and then the second thing i wanted to mention is that for the mandelbrot ta uh, task the color map you have to use is um uh, yeah just it's a specific color map that you should use in the task it says that you that you should uh, use a grayscale color map but this is not 100% specific so here it says grayscale color map this is not 100% specific because matplotlib has different grayscale color maps and uh, what one person did already is to use kind of the wrong one it's not wrong of course but uh, it's just not the one in the solution which uh, which the pytest uses to compare the plots and um, yeah that might be a problem um, and the correct one is called gray so spelled g-r-a-y and um, yeah there are different ones um, that that are available i can just um, open the documentation of matplotlib right now and show you so on this page they list a lot of uh, different color maps and here for example you can already see you have this grays one this is called grays with an e and a an plural s and this is the wrong one so you shouldn't use this one this is of course also a valid grayscale um, color map but yeah not the one in the sample solution here you have two more actually four more grayscale color maps which are all um well the, the last one is okay this is the correct one this gray um, but the three above here are also grayscale color maps but not the ones from the sample solution so be careful with that to always use this gray um, color map for the Mandelbrot task okay and i'm not sure there might even be more um, grayscale color maps there are lots of them yeah, yeah. okay now these ones were the ones from above but there's a wide range of different color maps that you can use but you have to use this one the, the gray with an a and no s this is the correct one okay these were the two points i wanted to talk about for the current homework are there any more questions regarding that? Um, yeah, sure, I can have a look at that error. If it's not too specific and maybe not too revealing, um, then of course I can have a look. Um, would you post the code just in the chat maybe? Okay, so it says um, it couldn't broadcast together the shapes um, 480 by 640 by 4 and this other one. Um, yeah, this is probably because on your side the plot has slightly different size than the like, goal plot or the, the expected plot. Um, are you specifying a figure size in your call to uh, plt.subplots? because you shouldn't do that. Um, the default figure size should be the correct one. And that's also what the expected plots used. And otherwise you should also not call the tight layout function. Um, Okay, yeah, but this I think this is a little too specific to go over in the practice right now. 
So I can have a look at that later maybe. All right. Uh, was everything clear with this bottom parameter in the last task? So when plotting this uh, air quality data, um, you're expected to have a stacked bar plot. Um, I hope this was all clear. But you have to use this bottom parameter in the bar function. And uh, in that you have to um, specify how much by how much the bars should be raised from the x-axis. This is what this bottom parameter does. And you have to call, uh, you have to pass this bottom um, parameter only to one of the two uh, bar calls. So you have to call bar uh, twice, once for the PM 2.5 data and once for the PM 10 data. But only one of them should get the bottom parameter. This might be something else that is a little, um, yeah, confusing. Okay, but then if there's nothing else regarding the current homework, um, oh, someone's typing. The bottom part, okay. So I'll talk about this a little more. Um, I just opened the documentation for the bar function. And um, I can show you what this means exactly. So you have this uh, pyplot.bar function, and this will create a bar plot. And you will have to give it the x values. So um, at which position on the x-axis uh, the, bar the bars should be. So this should be a sequence. Um, some iterable and then you also have to specify this height this is again a sequence um, or an iterable which has the same length as x and these two will specify where the bars are and how tall they are and then furthermore um, there's this bottom parameter that you have to use for one of the two calls um, yeah the task was I can maybe also just open the the plot that you should create. So this one, you should create this plot and the bottom parameter is concerned with this uh, lower plot here. And um, the first call here, the blue, uh, the blue bars are from one call to this um, bar function and the orange bars are from a second call to the bar function. And you will have to call um, bar with this PM 2.5 data first so this will not need any additional parameters. You just have to spe specify x and height. And then you have to call the bar function again using the uh, PM10 data. So creating these orange plots and these orange bars. And there you have to specify um, where they have to start. So where the bottom should be. And the bottom value um, or the bottom height of these bars should be above the or at the top of the blue bars. And this is what you can achieve with this bottom parameter. And bottom will also be a sequence or an iterable um, having the same length as your x and the height. And this will tell matplotlib that it should raise the bars in this call by the amount that is specified in the iterable stored in bottom. So you will have to use the PM 2.5 data um, to raise these orange bars up because the orange bars should just be on top of the PM 2.5, um, the blue bars. Did that explain your confusion? Okay, perfect. Um, 
yeah, so this bottom parameter is just, um, you can also use a scalar. This would uh, raise all the bars to the same height, but uh, you would have to use this array-like, so just a sequence of values. And um, as the documentation tells you, it's uh, the Y coordinates of the bars basis. So the bottom of the bars um, where, the, where they should be on the Y axis. And this defaults to zero. And this is why all the bars um, without specifying the bottom parameter will just be on the X axis. So if you want to raise them, you will have to specify a scalar or the array like. Um, but in, in the case of task three, it will have to be an uh, array like. So array like just means something that behaves like an array. Um, this is also yeah, kind of a reference to the duck typing in Python that it should just behave like an array and then it will work. So um, it should have um, operators to access, yeah, quack. <laughs> it should have operators to access the values. Um, and this will allow Matplotlib to just access any value in that bottom parameter. And uh, yeah, it's just a list or a NumPy array or probably a tuple would work as well. Just anything that you can access. <laughs> okay, then no further questions came up. I guess I'll just talk about the NumPy homework then. So homework four. If no one writes now. Okay, seems like everything is clear. All right. So, oh, another one. Another person is typing. Um, yeah, the NumPy bonus, um, you can still do that. And I'm not going to talk about the bonus task right now. I'm going to talk about the homework for, um, by NumPy bonus, you probably mean the, uh, bonus task for week five's, um, homework. And this is still running until next Tuesday, I think. So I will just talk about the homework for now, but the bonus task is kind of based on the lecture, yeah. With the knowledge from the lecture and maybe a little bit of research, um, you can definitely solve that. And yeah, this is what we expect anyways. So the, the homework is not designed for you to just copy the code from the homework and you're done. Um, the homework should actually yeah, make you learn something, which is probably something we all want. Did I, I I'm, I'm confused by, by your, by your message, Chris. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah, of course. Okay. Then I will talk about homework four now. Is my screen still shared? No, it looks like that freezed, froze, whatever this is. So I'll just stop this and restart it again. All right. So homework four, this was all about NumPy. And um, yeah, I just start with the first task. Um, here you had to create random arrays and the task told you that you have to implement the create data function. And um, yeah, this should return a data set with n samples, um, yeah, samples and four columns. So you should have n samples rows and four columns 
and then uh, it additionally talks about how these uh, random distributions should ha should be parameterized and yeah so i'll just start with the first task then the create data one okay and i'll also just quickly start a terminal here all right so um, first of all we delete this raise not implemented error because now we want to implement the function uh, this is something that some people still uh, forget to do or don't know that they should do but um, this raise not implemented error is actually an exception that is thrown um, and when you implement the function then you should definitely remove that because you did implement the function and uh, this not implemented error is just there by default to um, yeah signal to signal you that uh, this is not implemented yet if you call the create data function. So we will remove this um, whenever we, we implement the function. Okay, and what this will um, do this function is create these four random distributions. So we will have to return some. Um, NumPy array which uh, contains uh, four columns and these four columns should have random values with these four distributions and for that we'll just create these um, yeah, four arrays first so um, we'll first create four arrays which have um, n samples each and are just one-dimensional and contain the random values for um, yeah for these certain distributions so array one should be um, a random normal. So for that we have to use np.random.normal and it should have a mean of two and a standard deviation of three. And uh, yeah, the order of parameters in this normal function is mean, then standard deviation, and then the size. So we can just write mean two, standard deviation three, and then the size should be n samples. And this will create the first distribution. Then, um, yeah, we know the second one should also be um, a normal distribution, just with different mean and standard deviations. So here we just change uh, these parameters. Then the array three should have a different distribution. And this should be a uniform distribution. And uh, as the name uniform here suggests, already the function is just called uniform and uh, it should be in the interval from minus two to four, not including four. And uh, this is also tailored to this uniform function, which takes um, yeah, a, a range uh, in which the values should be created, and then again, a size of the array. And here we can again, just pass minus two and four and n samples to create this array. And oops, I deleted that and then Lastly, for the fourth array, we'll uh, again have a uniform distribution just with a different range. So here we just add this range. And now we have our four arrays, our four columns that we just need to combine and then return. And how do we combine these? Um, there are different options to do this, but I think the, um, the one that is the easiest for now is using stack. So we can just return np.stack and then uh, we have to pass our arrays. So I just um, yeah do this, and this should actually um, stack our arrays. And I'm not sure right now if this uh, will be um, four by n samples. So if we have four column, four rows, and then n samples columns, or the other way around. But this is not too important right now. We can just check this. Um, run py test and this will probably tell us we can also um, tell it that it should run test arrays dot pi and from that only the test create data um, function okay this does not exist how is it called um, wait, where is it here so it's called test create random arrays yeah so 
one could have called this <laughs> as the function that you were supposed to implement, but it's called it's called this now. So if we run this, then we see this one failed. And what was the problem? Function returned the wrong shape. Okay. Um, the the shapes were four one and uh, it should have been 1, 4. So what we can do to, to fix this is just transpose this and now this should work. No, it didn't work. Um, why didn't this work? The standard deviation of column 1 or 2 is wrong. So the standard deviation um, we have here are... Okay, we, we, uh, we set them to 4 and 5 Whereas here it says it should be a 3 and 5. I don't know how I missed that, but yeah, it should be 3 and 5. And now it works. Okay, perfect. So this is the first task solved. And now we can uh, go over to the second task. Um, okay, and by the way, people are writing in the chat. Chris, you're, uh, you're answering them. I'm not reading everything in the chat right now. So whenever there's a question regarding NumPy, um, could you maybe just, um, yeah, talk quickly to to let me know? Okay, thanks. All right. <clears throat> then the second task is um, about the aggregation functions, and um, yeah, here we have to implement three different functions. Uh, they're called dataset mean, dataset standard deviation, and dataset median. And these will um, just get uh, a data set which is similar as the one created by this create data function and should return mean standard deviation and median respectively. But the thing that um, yeah, you have to care about here or be careful about here is that they can contain NAN values. And I've talked about NAN values in the lecture. So um, yeah, we have to deal with them in some way. Um, yeah, but NumPy actually has a convenience function to deal with these values and it's very easy if you know this function and if you know the function um, then we just have to call I'm actually not sure right now is it NAN mean or mean NAN so we can just um, maybe use okay it's not working right now for me to um, use the autocomplete but I can just quickly Google that. Uh, okay, I wrote nano, not nan. <laughs> okay, and yeah, the function is called nan mean, and um, yeah, so we can just use nan mean, pass our data, and then it also said that it should return four elements, and uh, it should return the mean and the standard deviation and median for um, for the columns and not for the whole data set. So we, act, uh, we have to additionally pass this axis parameter and set this to zero because we want to um, return the mean of the rows. All right, then I will just uh, have a look how this next test called. Test data set mean. And we can see that it worked already. So this dataset mean function is now done. Um, the return data, uh, the dataset standard deviation one is very similar. We just have to return NAN STD and pass data and X is equals zero. And then we do the median one. And this is again, very simple, just as the ones above, um, yeah. Yeah, of course, I show that as well. Um, okay, but just to show you, um, this works now. So we have five tests passed, um, these functions work. And then I show you um, how you can also do this um, function if you don't know uh, about this NAN mean function. So I just uh, use the dataset mean here, but the other ones will just work in the same way. All right. So the way you would do it then is um, probably that you would uh, call mean for every column 
and for every column you will filter out the NaN values. And for that we can uh, probably use a list comprehension and um, this would be a one-liner then again. So um, yeah, we'll just do the list comprehension of um, our data. So I'll just call this D for now, um, for D in data. And this will go through the rows now, but we don't want this. We want to go through the columns. So we want to have a D um, as one column of the data set in each iteration of our list comprehension. And uh, the way we can achieve this is just use the transpose of data because um, when iterating over a NumPy array, it will always iterate over the first dimension. And if we transpose this, then the columns are our first dimension. And um, yeah, by that we can just iterate over the columns very easily. But now we want to um, filter out the NaN values of this column. And the way we do this is by indexing and um, we can index this D, this column, um, using the square brackets, and then, um, yeah, only take those values which are not NaN. And we can, um, there's a function in NumPy which returns you um, a Boolean mask with uh, all the NaN values true and the non-NaN values false. And this function is called isNaN. And we have to pass a D here. And now this would only use the NaN values and to invert this um, Boolean mask, we'll have to use this tilde. Um, yeah, and this character will invert the Boolean mask. I believe I also talked about this in the lecture. So this should be familiar to you. And now if I test this, okay, I get an error. Uh, it should actually return a NumPy array and not a list. So this list comprehension um, creates a list, of course. And to make this into an array, we just call the np.array function and it still failed. Chris, you want to say something? <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so this test still failed and I'm not actually sure why this failed right now. Oh, because, um, yeah, we didn't return a mean, we just returned um, the array with out the NAN values inside the list. So this is not what we wanted. And um, actually what failed is this np.array function. And uh, we can see that this prints the um, the documentation for the array function for some reason. But yeah, if we scroll up far enough, then we should be able to see that, okay, where is it actually? Yeah, this error is not very nice. <laughs> but what the problem is that um, np.array um, will need yeah, it will take um, just a list or a tuple or whatever. It will just take an iterable and create an array out of that. But it will always need to have defined sizes in all dimensions. So every dimension should have the same amount of elements. And this is not the case for us right now because the different columns might have uh, different amounts of NaN values. And um, yeah, this will make the np.array function fail because the different arrays in the second dimension will have different um, yeah, amounts of values. But um, we don't want to do this anyways, we want to return the mean. So we just call the mean function on this. And hopefully this works now. Yeah, it passes. So this is another way you could solve this function. Yeah, this is um, a little weird, probably, but NaN, uh, as Chris just said, 
um, is not equal to anything. And I can just demonstrate this if I import NumPy here in the in, uh, in the interactive interpreter, then I can write np.nan equals equals np.nan, and this is actually false. So, yeah, if you want to compare the values inside D to nan, you will have to use the isnan uh, function and not the equals equals. Thanks for bringing that up, Chris. Okay. And you could, of course, um, do this uh, analogously in the standard deviation and median function. While in the median function, it's a little different because there's no um, median function defined on an ND array directly. And I don't know why this is. This is a little confusing to me. But what you would have to do here is call np.median and pass the array um, because it's just not implemented for array dot median. All right, then the next task um, is masking. And here you have to implement this num significant function. And what this should do is return the number of elements that are outside of this interval, um, yeah, mean minus two times the standard deviation up to mean plus two times the standard deviation. So how do we do this? Um, as the name of the task already suggests, you should probably use masking. And um, yeah, you can use a pretty um, standard mask, mask, which just looks very similar to this actually. But if we want to do this, we should probably define um, mean and standard deviation of our array first. And as the task states that uh, array is a one-dimensional array so we don't have to care about uh, yeah, multiple columns or something like that we can just uh, treat array as one-dimensional okay so we first um, yeah um, assign the mean and standard deviation of this array to some variables and uh, we can call them mean and std for example and these equal array.mean and array.std and I'm actually not sure Chris probably knows about this a little better if this is bad style or not I like to do this because this is a very concise and just one line to assign these two values which are very similar um, but you could, could of course also do this in two lines so what this does is it um, internally actually creates a tuple here so this will be a tuple and then the assignment will take this tuple and assign it to these two variables. And uh, this mean one, uh, this mean variable will be assigned. So this array.mean will be assigned to this mean variable and array.standard deviation will be assigned to std. Um, yeah, I like to do this. I know, I don't know if this is pep8 perfect style. <laughs> okay. But then um, this function should return the number of elements outside the interval. And for that, we should probably take the length of some array which uh, is masked. Or actually, what we could also do is just compute how many um, values of this mask are true. And um, uh, it's very easy to do that in Python because booleans are actually numbers. So you could, for example, just call a sum on Boolean values, and this will interpret one, uh, a true as one and false as zero. And this is very convenient for this function. So we can just return um, this mask. And we create this mask by saying um, we want those elements of array um, where array is smaller than this uh, first value, so smaller than mean minus two times std. And we also want those values that are uh, larger than mean plus two times std. And if we want both, we probably have to use a, a bitwise or here. And this will um, just combine the two masks. So I will create another mask after this or sign. It will just combine the two masks element-wise with a uh, logical OR. And you will have to use the bitwise OR for that um, because the logical OR, just the literal OR, 
will um, evaluate the whole thing as a boolean. Uh, we don't want that. So the second mask we want to create is array. Um, so those elements of the array which are larger than mean plus two times std. Okay, and now this is just the mask, um, but we want to return the number of elements in this mask. And the way we do this is just call np.sum and we'll pass this whole thing. And this will just take the, uh, the trues and interpret them as ones and the false is um, as zeros. And this will just count how many true values there are. Okay, and this should actually be it already. I um, think it didn't work, of course. So if we just uh, use this function, uh, num significant, then we can have a look at the error. Um, the function don't return an integer. Okay, and uh, the problem here was uh, this, I think this also was mentioned a couple of times in the forum, um, that this error occurred and this is because um, this actually returns a numpy array and not an integer directly, but we can probably just pass this to this int function and int will just convert whatever is um, passed to this function to an integer and now this passes. So there's a difference between a numpy integer and a Python integer and the pytest checks if uh, we returned a Python integer and um, yeah, since NumPy is statically typed and uh, is therefore very specific about what the types are and how many bits each um, yeah, each element has and so on, um, it's sometimes a little difficult to compare the types of Python uh, variables to NumPy variables, but we can just um, convert the NumPy variable, so the NumPy int to a Python int by passing it to this int function. All right, now this function works as well and we go over to the task four and this is about sorting. And what we have to do is um, implement this sort by score function. And this should return the names um, sorted by the score. And we can already see in this function, we get two parameters, names and scores. And um, yeah, this function should return the names sorted by scores. So this is a problem that occurs very often that you want to sort one array uh, using the values of another array. And we can achieve this by um, yeah, looking at the indices of scores um, in a sorted way. So we take basically the indices of scores and um, shuffle them around such that they would um, index sorted uh, would index scores um, in a sorted manner. And um, since names um, matches scores and they have the same length and um, the first element of names, for example, matches the first element of scores, so they're associated, um, we can just use the sorted indices of scores to index names as well. And by that we get the sorted names. And the way we get these sorted uh, indices is by using np.argsort um, or actually calling argsort on the scores array and um, indexing names with this um, yeah, index array. So what we want to do is um, return names uh, with a special indexing and the indexing is scores.argsort and by default, argsort will um, sort from lowest to highest, I believe, but uh, this should return um, the, yeah, the scores from highest to lowest. And for that, we just have to return uh, reverse this argsort uh, array, so the index array, and we can do this by indexing this array and just yeah, reversing the order. And yeah, this will return the sorted names um, sorted by the scores. I'm not sure anymore if I created a separate pytest for this sort by score. Um, or is it? Yeah, so I did this. 
So we can just test if this works now. And we see this passes. So this works correctly now. Okay, next function, which is also part of this uh, sorting task, is get passed. And what get passed should do is just return the indices of the scores which uh, have 75 points or more. All right, and scores again is just uh, yeah, an array of um, scores, so of numbers. And um, the way we return the indices um, is by using either np.where or np.argware. So both of these functions return the indices, but just in a slightly different way. Um, so one of them can be used to index other arrays directly, and uh, the other one yeah, has some other purposes. Um, both of them are quite useful in different use cases. But we could use both of them here. Um, I will use mp.where now, and um, we want will, where will return um, a tuple of arrays, and in these arrays are the indices for the certain dimensions of scores. But since scores is one dimensional anyways, it will just be a tuple of one index array. So we don't have to care about the different dimensions. And this is also the difference uh, to argware. Argware will not return a tuple of arrays, but it will just uh, return one array with multiple dimensions. So um, yeah, this is the difference. And you can use argware to directly index um, other multidimensional arrays with that. Okay, but what we want to do is get the indices of um, the scores array, where scores um, is larger um, or equal than 75. And as I said, where returns a tuple of index arrays, um, and we just want the first one. So we just index this at the position zero, and this should do the trick already. Um, let me just check this. Yeah, this passes as well. and. Yeah, so this is task four done. Then lastly, the checkerboard. Um, I, hope, I hope I don't mess this up coding this live now because I have to think a little bit about um, the indexing and where it starts. But yeah, let's see if I can do this. So we have to create this checkerboard and I'll just call the variable board and um, create a um, numpy array uh, with the zeros inside. And this checkerboard should um, have the size, so the shape, n by n. It should be two-dimensional. And um, we get this parameter n here, which has um, yeah, the number of rows and the number of columns for our checkerboard. So we'll just create this n by n. And now this is just um, our checkerboard full of zeros but it should have a checkerboard pattern of zeros and ones. So we have to set some of these um, yeah, uh, fields in the board to one. So for that, we do indexing. And as it says here, the top left corner should be zero. So we shouldn't start indexing at zero um, because now we want to set some values to one and the zero should not be one, but we probably want to start at one. So this would be start at the first row, not the zeroth. So actually start at the second row. Um, and we want to additionally, um, yeah, we want to go to the end. So this is uh, why we just put a colon here. And then we also want to specify a step size. Um, and this should be two because the checkerboard is repeating every two tiles. And um, yeah, we want to set every second um, element to one. Then this is uh, this will get all the rows. So every second row starting from the second one. Um, but we don't want to set all the values in this row to one. This is why we also have to specify some um, some indexing in the second dimension. And here we want to start at the zeroth element because we want to have um, the first one should be the one right below the top left corner. And there should be a one because yeah, it's right next to the zero. So here we want to start at the zero one, at the zero position. 
um, because this is for the columns and the columns should start um, yeah, with a one, one below the top left corner. So here we start at zero and this is why we um, just write a colon and nothing in front. Then we also want to go until the end and also with a step size of two since it's a checkerboard. And this will set half of the values that should be one to one. No, it should be set to one, not to two. And um, yeah, we can maybe just print the board for now just to show you how it looks. And I believe this will print, yeah. So this is the board we just created and uh, the top left is still zero as we wanted. And then every second row has the correct pattern already. So this is uh, looking nice, but now we have to uh, work on these, um, the first row, the third row and so on. So for that, we have to create another indexing of our board. And this time we want to start with the first row. And this is why we just, yeah, start at the first one, uh, start at zero and do a step size of two again, because now we want to um, work on the first row, the third row and so on and not care about the ones that we already um, correctly assigned. And now for the second dimension, we don't want to start at the zeroth column, but at the first one, because the top left corner should uh, be a zero. So then we start at column one, go until the end with a step size of two and set this uh, to one as well. So if we run this, you can see we correctly created this checkerboard. And now our PyTest says all our tests passed, nine passed, and we're done with this task. Okay, perfect. So if you have any questions regarding this um, homework four, write in the chat now. Yeah, and what a timing. We have three minutes left in this practice session. So if there are any more questions, um, you have three minutes. <laughs> Okay, it doesn't look like anyone's typing. That's a good sign. Okay. And all the questions that came up in the chat are already answered by you, Chris. Looks like that, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Okay, but it looked like it was a lot. <laughs> looked like more than one. Okay, but I think then we're probably done with this practice session. If no questions um, are left. Okay. Then I think we can probably say goodbye. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>